Hello, everyone. We are so glad that you decided to join us today for our live Q&A. Today, we will be discussing Pastor Randy's final sermon in the series, The Abiding Disciple. And if you haven't gotten a chance to catch this message, I encourage you to do so right after this Q&A. You can go on to any one of our channels, the LUC.org, go to our YouTube channel, Roku channel, Facebook page, and watch the message there. The, the series, The Abiding Disciple, has centered around Jesus' final message to his disciples right before his crucifixion, as captured by John chapter 15. It centers around three relationships, our relationship with God, our relationships with each other, and our relationship with the world. And that's what we're going to be discussing today. What, what does a Christian's relationship with the world look like? How does the world relate with Christians and Christians relate with the world? Now, this live Q&A, we began this ministry right at the beginning of the pandemic as a way to connect in community, despite the fact that we are so disconnected physically. And over the past few months, I personally have really looked forward to this time as a way to learn and grow um, from each other's questions and comments, um, as the writer of Proverbs likes to write. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. And so I've appreciated the ways that you all have kept us sharp with your questions and comments. So I encourage you throughout this broadcast to continue to um, chat in your comments, your questions, your thoughts for us to keep us sharp. And you can begin today by chatting in where you're from, saying hello and, and happy Sabbath and letting us know where you're joining us from. And while you do that, I'm going to invite our guests, our two guests and our senior pastor to join me online now. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. Hello. Hi. Our our first guest is Chelsea Bartlett. She is one of our young professional spiritual leaders at Rooted. And Chelsea, you've been involved in our church for several years now, is that right? Yes, Mac with Relive. Yeah, you were a leader at Relive, our young adult group at the time. And now you're a leader at our young professionals group. Yeah. Yes. And if you've ever met Chelsea before, you know why I call her a spiritual leader. Her walk with Christ exudes out of everything that she does. Um, and also in her spare time, she uh, works at the School of Nursing at the Loma Linda University. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, like you said, I work at the School of Nursing. I teach there and I love working with very beginning quarter students and helping them really grasp what nursing is all about. Um, and other than that, I like doing mission trips to do medical work and vegan cooking, playing with my dog. <laughs> yeah, she has a very cute dog named Linus. Yes. And a couple of other dogs that are our guests in your home as well, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Our second guest is uh, Pastor Chris Chong, who's the senior pastor of Rock Fellowship at an Adventist church in Portland, Oregon. He's a powerful preacher and someone I so appreciate for his wisdom and his um, spiritual insights. So Pastor Chris, would you uh, introduce yourself to our group? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris. I currently live in Portland, Oregon. I've been at this church, Rock Fellowship, for close to five years, but I grew up in uh, Southern California. I'm an L.A. boy uh, through and through. <laughs> Fun fact, Joey was my youth pastor uh, when I was a teenager, and he worked me really good back then. He gave me all the worst youth leader jobs. <laughs> so I wasn't going to mention that because that makes me sound really, really old. <laughs> uh, that being said, it was Joey's first church right out of college, so he was pretty young, and I was like one of the oldest in the youth group at the time. <laughs> and we're not actually that far. <laughs> apart. <laughs> Chris, Chris was our junior deacon, and um, now I serve as the, um, the supporting pastor for the deacons ministry at Loma Linda University Church. So all the lessons that I learned from <laughs> leading Chris, I apply here at this <laughs> church. No, but it was a, a really formative time with Joey. He, he uh, helped me a lot. He helped guide me into ministry. I remember talking to him about whether I felt called. And so I'm, I'm profoundly thankful for Joey and his ministry and, and what he's done. 
and his friendship in my life as well. Mm. Yeah. I had a privilege of being his pastor, but now Chris has surpassed me in spiritual wisdom. So thank you for <laughs> joining know. us. <laughs> the, one, the one area that he has not surpassed me is in his um, choice of a football team because Chris is a Green Bay Packers fan. I could never yes. get him to uh, be a fan of the Washington football team. So <laughs> thank, thank the Lord for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know, Randy, how do you feel about Packers fan as a Dallas Cowboys fan? Jesus told us to love everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Even supporters of Aaron Rodgers, huh? <laughs> Suppose so. <laughs> and of course, we have our senior pastor, Randy Roberts, on here with us as well. Um, and Randy, for those of you, those of um, the, the people joining us who have may not have had a chance to listen to our sermon yet. Would you give a quick synopsis uh, of it to frame our discussion? Sure, so as you mentioned, you gave a brief synopsis of the chapter. We've been spending time in John, the 15th chapter. Those final chapters of John's gospel, John 13 through 17 in particular, are just deeply meaningful. Uh, you see the heart of Jesus there in a way that you may not see it anywhere else. It's as though he's talking with his disciples. And like I mentioned the first week, the conversation is slow, but it's urgent. Kind of these two juxtapositions. A slow because some things you just can't talk about in a hurry. And urgent because he's right at the end of his life. These are things that have to be communicated. So today we talked about Jesus' understanding of the disciples' relationship to the world around him or her. And I think basically what Jesus says there can be summarized by saying, what the master received, the disciple can expect. What the master received, the disciple can expect. Uh, we have a need to be liked. And that's a human need, I suppose. And I suppose there's nothing really wrong with it as long as it doesn't end up compromising who we are. Uh, but Jesus gives us a warning and says, don't expect the world to like you. Look how they're treating me. And when you're living a life that is abiding in me, you will be able to expect some similar treatment. I want to hasten to add, I am profoundly grateful for religious liberty and to live in a country where we haven't faced some of this kind of treatment, much of it maybe. But we shouldn't kid ourselves. We have brothers and sisters around the world who wake up to that every day of their lives. So there are people who are actively living out what Jesus talked about. And we can expect a future where that will be present as well. So if I break it down into two pieces, I would say the disciple looks for a Jesus, looks to Jesus for a model of what to expect, and the disciple looks to Jesus for a model of how to respond. So in general terms, that's the, the outline of the sermon. Wow, thank you so much, Randy. Now we're gonna dive into discussing this, but before we do, we wanna say hello to some, some of you who are joining us. Um, as usual, we have people from all around the world. We have Paulino um, from Brazil. So thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. We have, um, now I'm going to let Chelsea pronounce this name from Red Deer. <laughs> Ponama. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Up in Red Deer, Canada. And Jean Bryce from St. Lucia. I have to confess, I would, Joy, I'd love to be in St. Lucia. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where St. Lucia is. I'm sorry. Where Where is St. Lucia? I'll, I'll let Pastor Chris answer that. I can see on his face he's dying to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that one of the Caribbean uh, islands? Caribbean uh, or something. Yeah. And that's messed up because I literally have a friend another pastor in Detroit uh, from St. Lucia. And I don't exactly, I think it's in the Caribbean somewhere. Yeah, in the Caribbean. That's wonderful. And then Joey, back from your neck of the woods, back in, in Maryland, Durwood, Maryland, Bob Rova. 
Yeah, from Durwood, Maryland. I I miss Maryland so much, and I hope he's a he's a Washington football fan and moving uh, right along. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Sabbath from Alaska. Wow. 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 I bet it's a little cooler there than here. And look at that, Joey. Adelaide, Australia. Merrick Dana Jantos. Um, Beautiful. We have someone here, Joey. Maybe you caught there where they were who are from, who's from uh, Ghana. Here we go. Um, from Accra, Ghana, Joey. And... Uh, you can share their name with us. <laughs> I'm sorry. I do not want to butcher your name, but we are so glad that you're joining us. Yes, today. we are. Yes. Wow. I wish you could tell us how to say your beautiful name, but it's a little bit hard for us to bend our tongues and lips around it, but it's, it looks beautiful. It looks a, bit like, a little bit like a Hawaiian name, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Yeah. And there's Joseph Mann from Port Townsend, uh, Washington, who's enjoying the break from the rain, toasty oh 47 degrees. Is that what the weather is like in Oregon too? Uh, yeah, pretty much. And it's pretty nice. It's all sunny today, no rain. Yeah. We're hitting actually low 50s, so that's amazing. And what is it with you people from the Pacific Northwest who are Packers fans? I, I don't understand this. It's, uh, Just, <laughs> it's a special Packers. place. It's a special place. <laughs> And we Gene, also have Gene answered our question, Joey. Yes. There we go. <laughs> so Chris is correct. Yes. That's great. We also have Tim Rawson, um, who's our business administrator here, but he's joining us from Orlando, Florida. Well, look at that. There we go. That's that all works. my family's in Orlando. Is that a fact? Wow. Uh, you know, Chelsea, the the California abbreviation sometimes is ca and sometimes it's c a l i f i was told that c a l i f stands for come and live in florida <laughs> <laughs> i'm sure my sister would agree with that <laughs> oh man oh man yes we also have um donahi um from Mexico joining us, and um, uh, Sonia also joining us. So welcome, Beautiful. both of you. Sonia Giles, very good. Uh, Grace Nobly is also joining us. She's she's joined us many times in the past, so we're glad to have her as well. Saying happy Sabbath. Yeah, and Brian and Jasmine McIntosh from Highland, California. Not as far away, but uh, we're all also... from us. Yeah. Brian and Jasmine, delighted to have you. Here's somebody with a good name, Joey. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Shirley yeah, Shirley is a really great name. Shirley <laughs> and I are at least brother and sister in Christ. That's Amen. for sure. And <laughs> like Roberts will claim kinship any day. <laughs> oh, and another person from back east, Christian Soto from Washington, D.C. Yes. Oh, look at that. Christian, yeah. his family lived out here for, for years. It's, I'm delighted to see him. Very good. Well, it's good to have all of you here with us and continue to chat in your questions, your comments. Um, we'd love to uh, connect with you throughout this discussion. But I'd like to begin with a question about something that you said at the beginning of your sermon, Randy. You talked about the high expectations that we humans sometimes have. And I wanted to ask the group, what impact, what impact does it have on our spiritual journey when those expectations are unmet? Especially if we have expectations of God and how he will interact with us, how he will intervene in our lives, and those, those expectations become unmet. How does that impact our own spiritual journeys? Well, I want to just say that I, I took note of what Chelsea said about her joy in, I don't remember your exact words, Chelsea, but it was kind of in shepherding young students coming into nursing. And I'm going to read between the lines a little bit, which I may be wrong, but 
I think this is quite common when, when kids come into school, into new professions and so forth. You come in with a level of expectations that's pretty high about what it's all going to be. And part of the educational process and part of the adjustment process is adjusting those expectations to something that's more realistic. And uh, I suspect that goes on in nursing. It probably goes on in all of our careers. So mm -hmm. I once heard somebody say, Joey, that expectations are nothing more than invitations to anger and frustration and disappointment because they're so seldom realized. Yeah. I suppose that's true in the spiritual life as well. Yeah. So life rarely turns out the way that we expect. Yeah. You know, the, the experience with expectations and unmet expectations actually is a very, um, it's like a cornerstone of my personal walk with God. Um, it was when I was doing, um, you know, I was like doing six weeks of mission work in the summer after high school. I had these crazy high expectations for um, the mission trip. And Joey knows it was this Korean ministry called Kayam. And, you know, I went as a mission. Joey went as a missionary as well before. And I heard all these amazing stories of God doing all these crazy things. And like, I, I wanted that. And then I, I also was this kind of strange kind of kid. I wanted like a lot of suffering, you know, as a missionary, which is so ridiculous. But I was like, I want bug bites and I want like pain. And I want all that stuff. Because I was like, you know, that was really cool. Um, and then I remember being so upset with God because like we got a house to live in that was really nice and people fed <laughs> us amazing food. And I was like, oh, so angry. And it's such a strange experience. However, what happened was the unmet expectations led to a lot of anger, as as Randy was saying. Um, and it was only until I was able to basically say, you know what, God, whatever you want, no more expectations. I'll take whatever you give me. And I'm going to surrender it. And it was only then where actually God turned it around and actually all the stuff that I wanted, it happened, you know? So like, <laughs> the <bug bite. laughs> so early on in my own journey as a Christian, I knew like, we got to give it up to God and we can have, I guess we can have expectations because that's kind of normal. However, we always have to give God the freedom or it's just going to lead to a lot of frustration and, and, and pain. Mm. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. I think that's the first time that I've heard of someone praying to get bug bites. And yeah. I was, I was my youth pastor, he was like teaching me some weird stuff. Back in the day. I know, some bad theology. Being <laughs> oh, man. But it's true. Like you go on a mission trip, you expect to have some war stories, right? When you come exactly. back. Exactly. Yeah. 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 It's the, the power of unmet expectations. I'd be curious, Chelsea, what do you see in young nursing students coming in? You know, I think, and this is evident in the amount of burnout that we have in nurses, even when they start working is you start, you go into nursing because you want to help people. And then you get into nursing and you realize there's all this other stuff that goes into it. That's not direct patient care and being with people. And that that thing that you wanted to do was really connect with people when they're hurting. A lot of times you don't have time to do uh, because of the way the system is. And I think a lot of people, um, they struggle with that disconnect of thinking, I'm really going to make a, bit a difference and then feeling like you aren't or feeling like you're not able to provide the care that you want. And so I uh, I think students and nurses beginning really struggle with that, um, with not the kind of the moral ambiguity of not being able to really do the best that you know you could. That's wow. very interesting. Well, I will say this, in my years working as a hospital chaplain, I came to believe that nurses make the world go around. And uh, that's certainly true in, in the healthcare professions. But yeah, you're right. And I think, Joey, that kind of, I don't know that it would have been articulated in the terms we we're talking about, but I think that is part of what Jesus is saying to his disciples here mm -hmm. is, I want you to have the right ex set of expectations about what your relationship with the world is going to be. You need to be thinking clearly about what's coming. 
That's true. Lisa Thomas puts it well when she says um, in the chat at 2.19 p.m., your expectations always have to coincide with God's desires for you or they will result in disappointment. But Sonia brings up a good question. Um, Sonia Giles, she's, she writes, it's difficult not to have high expectations in the spiritual side of our lives when we have so many verses like the one in John 15, seven that states, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. I read these types of verses with a grain of salt. Sorry if I'm being too cynic, I'm playing at being a little argumentative. So how would you respond to that? How do you respond to the fact that Jesus does invite us to share our desires with him and, and um, express our needs and desires? And what happens when they don't happen the way that we wish? I think, I, go ahead, please. Oh, I was gonna say that I really resonate with this because um, you know, two years ago, I kind of went through a spiritual crisis of my expectations of God was that he was a loving God and that he was gonna take care of his children. And, the, and he is, but what I expected of what that looked like was different than what was reality. Um, and so for me, kind of this, those high expectations, what it ended up with me was me, when those expectations weren't met, I started doubting, is God really love? And then that moves into, if I believe that my value comes from being a child of God, of a loving God, and God isn't love, then who am I? And it kind of snowballs. And I think that that's, it's, it is something that you really struggle with because when we read about you know, people being healed from diseases and that doesn't happen to us all the time, that those prayers aren't always answered. And I think that that is a struggle that is very real for a lot of people. Um, and so I, I just want to say I resonate. I don't have answers. I just resonate with it. Yeah, I think Sonia's question is a very valid one. Just like Chelsea has said, if we're honest with ourselves, most of us have had some experience or experiences in life that bring us up against that reality. And it's not an easy one to sort through. What I would say is often if you read carefully what a passage is saying makes more sense in its setting and context. For example, this one in John 15, 7, uh, Jesus in that context is talking specifically about the life of abiding in him and the life of being a fruitful disciple. And that first part of verse seven said, of that verse seven says, if you remain in me, that is, if you abide in me and my words remain in you, if my word abides in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. So if you put it in the context of the original statement, I think I'm not uh, doing violence to what Jesus says by saying what he's saying is in this life of abiding, when it comes to the needs, the spiritual needs you have to surrender, to connect with me, to grow in me, uh, those needs will be fully satisfied so that you can truly be an abiding disciple that is fruitful. So I think that's part of putting it in its context. I think part of putting it in its context is also to be fair to the metaphor that Jesus is using, the metaphor of growing fruit, because growing fruit does not happen quickly. It's a long protracted process. And so I think sometimes maybe we read that if we ask, we'll get, I know that's what I read in my young adult years. We had a teacher come through the town where I was in college, a wonderful person, loved his presentations, but he had it very simply outlined, A, B, C, ask, believe, claim. So if you did what the Bible said in those lines, you would get your answer. It would definitely come. And I soon discovered life just doesn't work that simply or that way. So putting it into the context of what you need to be an abiding disciple what you need to be a fruitful disciple is available to you, but it may take some time. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think from, from a practical standpoint, um, you know, as a pastor, I want to 
pray big things because I believe in a big God. So at the same time, I feel like it honors him to pray big prayers of, of change and transformation. Um, but then, you know, we have to understand the reality that lots of people experience things that are not that where it didn't happen or, or the answer was no. Um, and what I've kind of taught and counseled people was we kind of have to have just be fully two things. We have to pray boldly. So pray boldly, pray like for the biggest thing, but then we also need to pray surrendered. Like we need to have those both at the same time. And that's hard. It's hard to have both concepts moving in our prayers, but pray boldly, but also pray surrendered. And I think we honor him by offering these big prayers and wanting these amazing things, but we have to trust. And so at the same time, we have to give God the freedom. We cannot demand him. <laughs> He's God. We can't demand that he do anything. And so we, we, we move, move forward in, in a surrendered fashion, you know, and, and that's kind of how I like to think about this from a practical standpoint. Yeah. And you see similar um, comments in the, in the chat with um, Jonah Green, who says at 2.50, 2.25 p.m., um, when our will does not align with God's will for our life, we will feel like God gives us a short straw. Um, Joseph Mann, right after, perhaps the greatest challenge to our own spiritual state is our overestimation of how well we see the right answer to every prayer. I am forever blessed by not having always received that which I asked. Yeah. There's actually a, a great country song about this. Uh, I don't know who, I don't know who sings it, but it's, I think it's called like, sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers. Yeah. Good yeah. song. Some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. Yeah. That's not, what they say. not that I knew the exact words, but just. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, another thing, Joey, to remember in the context here of this particular statement, because uh, there are, as as um, I'm going back here to make sure I have the right name, as Sonia uh, pointed out, there are other statements like this in Scripture. But in the context of this particular statement, I think we also have to remember that Within an hour or two, just within a very brief time, Jesus himself is praying, God, please let this cup pass. Mm -hmm. And then he's coming back to, nevertheless, not my will, but yours. So in his own life, having just said that, he's experiencing that deep, dark wrestling with the reality that he's facing and wishing it were different. So there's never just a simple, easy answer to these things. But I think we can depend on God to walk with us through that dark time, even though at times that walking with us will not be a sense of his presence, but it will come through other people who put their arms around us, hug us and help us along the way. Yeah. And also, there's that th what you addressed in in the message so eloquently, Randy, about the pervasive sinfulness of this world and how that also impacts um, how God's will gets done in this world as well. Um, I, I want to ask the question: You know, we live in a nation that that is of religious liberty, and we've kind of at times grown to expect religious priority for for Christianity. Uh, Christians have have experienced this, held the position of privilege in the United States for a long time. Uh, I remember that the LA Times used to print service times for worships. I mean, think about that. The LA Times used to print service times for worships. Um, Sermon titles, Bible reading plan. You're yeah. exactly right. Yeah. So, And that was not that long ago. Um, and, and I guess for people who have who grew up in that area, era, it is difficult to say, oh, the, the nation is changing. Is that something that we should fight for again? Do you think that's a part of God's will to bring us back to that Christianized nation where Christianity has that position of privilege in, in the United States again? Or should we expect the world to get more hostile like, like you were expressing in, in the message? Well, I for one would say that as things get darker and more difficult, then it's up to the church to be the church. Um, I've quoted this before, so I'll, I'll ask forgiveness for those who may remember it, but I've thought a lot 
over the last few years since I read it about an incident that the Christian writer Philip Yancey tells about encountering a Muslim gentleman and they, they had a conversation about things of faith. And this Muslim gentleman said, I have read my Quran and I have read your Bible. And it strikes me that I don't find in my Quran any instruction to us as Muslims on how to live as a minority in society. And I don't find in your Bible any instructions for Christians on how to live as a majority in society. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very insightful comment because the New Testament was a world in which the followers of Jesus were a distinct, not somewhat, but a distinct minority. Mm -hmm. And they had to live in that context, the, the life and the love and the message of Jesus, and they had to be a light in a dark world. I fear that in the modern context, certainly here in this country that I love, but maybe in other countries around the globe as well, the church has depended way too much on the civil authorities to protect our rights. Now, I want to be careful here because I think we should be eternally vigilant to stand and to contend for freedom. So I don't want I don't want to have that misunderstood. But what I'm saying is when those freedoms are lost, are we able to be the church? When we have become a minority in society, are we able to be a light in the darkness? Mm. I think that's an important question for us to wrestle with. That's a great point. And does this change when we are the majority? Does, does what we search for and try to do change when we are the majority versus when we are the minority? Do different responsibilities come to us if we are the majority? And do different responsibilities come to us when we are the minority? And are we as gracious and kind and accepting of others when we're the majority as we expect them to be of us when we're the minority? Wow. wow. Yeah, I think it's a strange kind of time we live in as the church relates to the country because we've so used to being the majority. But, you know, if you look at the stats, we're not really anymore, right? The majority are the nuns, right? That's like the, that's the majority, but we, we act like we still are. And, you know, as, uh, as, as some have said, when you're the majority, you know, you try to do things to maintain your status as the majority. So yeah, Joey, I, I do think that there are some changes and it needs to be thoughtful, you know, realizing where we are, who we are, and how we're supposed to represent Christ in this world, I think we need to think long and hard about that. Yeah. So seeing how we're, we're seeing this shift from majority to minority in, in Christianity in the United States, Randy, like you addressed it elsewhere around the world, that's always been the case. Uh, there are some nations where, where being a Christian is a minority religion, that's the reality that they live in. But in the specifically here in the United States, um, what what are some ways that you have experienced some hostility to the message uh, of Christ to following God's way? Um, how have you experienced that? Let me share a conversation I had with a young adult uh, some some time ago, who said, uh, "I'm studying." in a secular university and the people that I am in a study group with um, mock Christian faith regularly. They make fun of it. They laugh about it. And I've just kind of kept my mouth shut. I haven't said anything. And then one day one of them said to me, somehow that had come up and made a comment to me about that. And then said, you're not a Christian, are you? <laughs> and this young adult with some some evident pain said to me I just kind of laughed and said oh no and then I I walked away and I went home just in anguish thinking what have I done 
And in this simple setting, uh, being unable to answer that, you know, and I, and I looked at that situation and I thought, I understand. I had no condemnation for this person. I understand it gets very hard. And I think to be able to stand with firmness, but with grace. Yeah. But I question, Joe, to go back to your question, I'm not sure how much I face that. Mm. You know, I'm, a, I'm a pastor. I'm evidently a whole Christian. And so maybe people adjust their expectations to that. I don't know. Your position is already, because you're a pastor and people realize that when they realize that you are a pastor, they're, they already know what that means. And so they just sort of shift their expectations accordingly. It can be very awkward, actually. And Joey and Chris, as pastors, probably know that, that, that something will come up and everybody kind of looks at you and <laughs> it's an awkward feeling. Like on the airplane or something before when we can travel. Hey, what do you do? Well, pastor. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they put in their earbuds. <laughs> oh, fuck you. Oh man, I had one time when I was sitting next to this lady on the plane, and we were, you know, we were just chatting, and uh, she, she was she was talking about her, how her husband was. Um, and an inspirational speaker and how she supported his his work. And then and then she turned to me and she says, So what do you do? And I said, Oh, I'm a pastor. And she's like, Oh yeah, that's what my father, my husband is too. He's a pastor. And I was like, Wow, I never oh. never even thought to, to frame myself as an inspirational yeah. speaker. Yeah. <laughs> wow. One way to get around all all of that baggage that's associated with being a pastor. <laughs> I was looking here in the chat. There have been some very good uh, statements made. Um, let me just see here. Debbie Carrit at 234 about what we were talking about just a moment ago. Never stop praying. Possibly the problem slash natural consequences that individual faces may help them realize their need. We may not see the fruits of our prayers in our lifetime. That, I think, is a wise statement, and it goes to that issue of do we get what we pray for? Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's probably of God's mercy that we don't, and sometimes it may be um, a much longer journey to that than we would have hoped or expected. The other interesting comment is David Smith at 235, who says, some of the best writing on this issue of religious liberty and pluralistic society has been done by John Meacham and the late Chuck Colson, who penned Kingdoms in Conflict. I, I read Kingdoms in Conflict years ago, and it had a profound effect on me. Um, well worth the time. Wow. Powerful. You know, that uh, comment by Debbie, it's actually, I think she was responding to a question that the follow-up question that Sonia had put um, at 2.30 p.m., um, she asked, when we pray for a loved one who has struggled for decades with unwise choices, which create serious problems for themselves and the rest of the family with no positive results, do we give up praying? And I, I, I love Debbie's response to that. Never stop praying. Yeah. Never stop praying. Yeah. Um, so, so this, this hostility that we face, um, I, I was wondering, you know, we, we talk about how the world as a system is also is hostile to the um, the way of, of Christ. Are there times that we as followers of Christ have also been hostile to the way of Christ? Um, when I think of, about scripture, um, there are many times when people who have purported to be his followers or who were his followers didn't really understand what he was doing and were hostile to what God was trying to accomplish. Um, are we susceptible that, to that today? I think we're deeply susceptible to it. In fact, honestly, uh, sometimes the hostility of the world has come to us for very legitimate reasons, mm -hmm. just based on how we have conducted ourselves. I, I saw a bumper sticker around town a while back 
said, Jesus, save me from your followers. <laughs> and I thought, boy, that, that sadly is too many times true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say, Joy, I think we're very susceptible to that at times. And I think that it might even be a symptom of, kind of being the majority <clears throat> or being the people in quote unquote power. Because that's when you start having other priorities rather than the mission itself. Right? Like when it's just you by yourself or small. And like we see this in churches too. Like when it's a church startup, a church plant, they're like, they got it right. You know, and that's what they teach us in seminary is church plants are the healthiest churches because they're all about evangelism. They're all about serving. Right. And then it's when you get to these big, uh, bigger churches, you start getting more concerns about, you know, carpet color and you know what not not to step on anyone's toes or anything but you know you just have more things to protect uh, mm -hmm. that can lead you to make some bad decisions as an organization so um yeah i would agree that we have to be really careful we're very susceptible to that especially as the as having been the majority faith for so long chris i just wanted to let you know that loma linda university church just finished a building project uh, we had to pick lots of carpet colors, so. <laughs> <laughs> we went through one too, you know, and people talk about that, right? Like it can be a crazy time. And I'm sure Loma Linda University was very different. I'm sure it was fantastic and awesome, but you know, it can be tough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but even in our pastor's um, staff meeting this past week, Randy, if you remember, we discussed this, the, um, the both the benefits and the challenges of being an institutional church. Um, I had shared what my one of my professors had said about institutions. He said, institutions are great in that um, they are institutions are created because a of a they there is a belief of a vision and a mission that they feel like is so important that it's worth preserving, mm -hmm. that it's worth la outlasting that first generation. So they create an institution for it. The challenge is sometimes, as you pointed out, Chris. Um, we can lose easily lose sight of that mission and be all about institutional survival rather than mission propagation. And that's when we get into difficulty. Yeah. And, and like you see this and there's no number, you know, there's no size. You see this like small organizations, medium, big, right? Just as soon as you start prioritizing that survival over the, the mission, uh, that's when it starts to get challenging. Yeah. Great point. Very true. Very true. Yeah. I'd be curious, Chelsea, uh, in in your work as a as a healthcare professor or a healthcare provider, uh, how open, in your estimation, are patients to to hearing somebody share spiritually or address? Uh, the spiritual side of their experience. Yeah, you know, I, I, it's interesting you say that. I, I have only had one person ever tell me they did not want prayer. Um, even people who, and I will admit, I did not offer it as often as I should have. Um, but I have only had one person who, when I offered to pray with them, they said, "No, I don't. I don't need that." Um, I think, and and it is different when you're interacting with people in the hospital at a place where they're vulnerable and they're struggling and they're scared. And I think recognizing that people often will have very strong opinions about religion outside of that, but when they are scared and they're vulnerable, that they tend to kind of latch on to something. And so most people that I have interacted with who I've offered prayer are profoundly grateful, even, even though you know that they're not religious people outside of that. But in that moment, it means a lot to them. So I think there's still something to that higher power and God's love that people still, it's an underlying theme that maybe they don't live out in their everyday life, but when they're in trouble, they value it. Yeah, it's really true, isn't it? It just kind of brings us face to face with, with our mortality and with the uncertainty of life and with eternity and I think it's pretty understandable that people's thoughts would turn in a spiritual direction at a point like that. Yeah. And yet, 
do we, you know, that's so interesting that you say that because you know, in, in some of those instances, I think I would be afraid to ask if they want prayer, you know, that I'd be worried about whether I was intruding too much, if I was imposing my beliefs on them. So, you know, Randy, that reminds me of something that you said in your sermon about the need to be liked or the desire to be liked, um, that when, you know, everybody likes to be liked, but when we need to be liked, we become a slave to people's expectations, to the world's expectations. Where do you think that comes from? Where does that need to be liked come from? And how do we lessen its hold over us? I, th I think it comes from God in the sense that God created us to be relational beings that we need each other, we need to interact with each other, and that it is this beautiful gift God gave us to need each other that Satan has perverted to be this need to be liked by everybody. Mm. Um, and so I think deep down that desire to be in communion with people is from him. Um, I think that the way we combat wanting to be liked by other people is because we have our value is not coming from God. It's coming from external sources, from our job or from our possessions or whatever it may be. And if our value is from that, we need external affirmation. But if our value comes from being a child of God, we don't need the external affirmation because we get it from we gain that from him. And the way to do that is by abiding, that you take that time to build, intentionally building your relationship with God. Wow, that's so powerful, Chelsea, that our sense of self becomes more confident when we spend that time abiding in Christ because our identity comes from him. Wow. I think there's really something to that. I suspect that if our deepest needs for belonging and for being loved and accepted are met in Christ, then the intensity of the need to be liked by everyone else will diminish. Mm -hmm. I don't know that it will ever disappear. And, you know, it's probably a, a good thing to have that balance just to keep us being gracious people. But, but I think if, we're, if, if we know we are loved, if we know we are accepted, forgiven, that we belong to Christ, that our lives are hidden with Christ and God, then the, the intensity of that need, please like me, I think, uh, yeah, I think that probably begins to evaporate. You know, that reminds me of um, something written by sociologist George Herbert Mead about the generalized other, um, the sort of mental jury box that all of us carry about, you know, um, the people's opinions that we value the most, we carry around with us. And usually when we make decisions, we make decisions based on what we think that they will think about that decision, right? It's not what they actually think about the decision, but what we think they think about the decision. And yet um, maybe maybe what you're saying, Chelsea, is, is we abide in Christ so much that he becomes the sole resident of that mental jury box and the others are not... Um, their voices are not as loud. So powerful. Yeah. Pastor Chris, did you have any Yeah, I really appreciated this part of the message. Um, this is a struggle for lots of people, especially people in leadership. Uh, pastors can probably really relate to um, this need or this desire to be light. And so it was, it was challenging, and I really appreciated kind of the, the distinction. And, you know, like, because I think my natural thought was I shouldn't care. I shouldn't care. Like it should not be about that. But like it is a part of us. And so I felt, you know, encouraged that it, it's good to be liked. But then, you know, the way um, Randy was able to distinguish that from the need, I thought was very helpful um, and gave me something to think about. You know, I think what's weird, though, and I don't know if you guys ever feel this, that where you seem Oftentimes you can care about the opinions of people that you don't even know and more so than the people that you do care about a lot, you know, and, and as I don't know, I'm sure we have this in, in all industries of, 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 you know, represented here, but ministry, um, you know, you give a sermon 
and you get 99 people saying, man, Pastor Dell's awesome. And then you get one person like, nah, man, that was not it. What do we dwell on, right? What do we think about? You know, or maybe as a nurse, if you have 99 patients, like, thank you so much. And then you got the one. <laughs> what do we dwell on? You know, it's a strange. And, and I think what it requires, and I think the answer is still what you guys said, abiding in Christ. I think he recalibrates our minds and what we value. And it just like takes constant effort, you know, recalibrating every single day about what's important. Yeah. So that is powerful. so true, Chris. Uh, you are so right <laughs> on two or three fronts in what you just said. Um, I, I was visited by a gentleman in this office, in fact, right back there, the week before I preached my first sermon at this church. It happens that today is his 89th birthday. So this was 20 years ago, and, and, and he came in to pray with me like on Thursday before that first Sabbath. And then he gave me a piece of advice that I've never forgotten. He said, Randy, just remember, you only have to please one. Mm. That's all you have to worry about. You only have to please one. And that has echoed in my mind many times over the years. Wow. So powerful. Um, Margaret Lagos in the chat at 2.49 p.m. says something similar. She says, I found that the more I entrust my life to God, what humans think of me affects me much less. Keeping our sights on eternity dims the chaos around us. Um, Sonia also um, adds, um, yes, Chelsea, the chat, the one right after, that is called locus of control, I think. Uh, internal versus external need for approval and what drives us in our lives. So when we do that, we're able to stay firm on what um, God's way is, despite the hostility we face in the world around us. I'm reminded of a quote by G.K. Chesterton, who, who wrote, um, do not be so open-minded that your brains fall out. <laughs> And yet we live in a society that really the, the prime virtue is open-mindedness, right? Mm -hmm. The prime virtue is tolerance. And the only people that you can be intolerant to are people who are intolerant, right? Yet Christianity is all framed, like Randy, you said um, in, in the sermon, that um, Rome was bound to reject Christianity because Rome was tolerant, right? That, that quote, I thought that was so powerful. That's the same spirit of this age. It's a it, tolerance rules. So the question is, uh, should Christians try to be framed as tolerant? Or is it the reality to a certain extent that because we are following Christ and, you know, Jesus is the only way to, to, to God, that intolerance is sort of in our DNA? How would you respond to that? Well, one of the one of the things I would say to that would be to say that there was something in the person of Jesus that allowed him to be utterly clear about his identity and about his ethic, and yet able to be around anyone. You know, one of the accusations that got thrown his way was that he, you know, you welcome anybody. You'll hang out with anybody. I don't understand this. You know, how, how can you claim to be who you are? And you're hanging out with those people, you know, and that was a, that's what they just kept throwing in his face. So there was something about Jesus that made people feel welcomed, particularly the people that didn't get welcomed to most of the religious settings. It made them feel welcome, but I don't think you had anybody who, questioned what was at the core of Jesus, that he stood for things and against things. Mm -hmm. Something about him was open enough that people were drawn into the orb of his love and his grace. Mm -hmm. it, ought to, it ought to sober me up some anyway to realize that the people that had the hardest time with Jesus were people like me. People who were professional religious leaders, mm -hmm. those are the ones that had the hardest time with them. So I don't know that if it's tolerance, Joey, I think I think it's it's actual love, not love in the sense of having warm, glowy feelings toward people, but love in the sense of acting in their best interest, act in ways that honor them and that help them. 
Yeah. I think what Jesus, you know, was able to do was he was able to see people and look past all the other stuff. He was able to look past their problems or their status, regardless of whether they had high status or low status. He looked past it and he saw the person. And I don't know, I, I feel like you guys have probably, you probably know people like that who can do that. And you know how they make you feel when they look at you and you connect with them and you're like, this person sees me for who I am and loves me and they don't care that I'm low or high or whatever, you know? And I think Jesus somehow transcended all those classes and all those divisions and he could still stand for what he stood for, but people knew that, hey, he knows me for who I am and he loves me. And that's amazing, that's really hard. But that's like why Jesus is Jesus, you know? <laughs> that's right, Chris. Yeah. That's a great statement. That's why Jesus is Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> You know, David Warner, um, it, it's been repeated in the chat a few times, but David Warner put, um, Christians shouldn't be tolerant. Christians are called to be loving. Uh, David B. Smith on the same vein writes, Jesus tolerated these broken people, but he never tolerated their lostness, right? And then um, Lisa Thomas at 255, Jesus's love for people shine through. So then I guess my follow-up question is then, um, if what we're called to be is loving, what does it look like to love a world that is hostile to us? What does that look like? How do we show love to a world? Because as Randy, you said, what Jesus modeled um, was that um, the world is going to hate you, but you, like Jesus did, will love it. So what does that look like for us to love a world that is actively hostile to the way of God? I think it needs to look the same as if the world was not hostile to us, that whether they're hostile or not, we still live the life that Jesus lived. We still aspire to live like him and love like him. Wow. Well, that's a great answer. And that is so hard to live out. But I think that's where that's why it's so interesting that at the end of Jesus talking about these things in John 15, the last two verses of the chapter have to do with the coming of the Holy Spirit. So it's as though Jesus comes to the end of talking about this. And if the disciples have allowed any of this to really register, you know, their eyes are that big and they're thinking, how in the world are we supposed to do this? And Jesus speaks to that immediately and says, look, I'm sending you the paracletos, the paraclete, the one who comes alongside, the advocate, the comforter, the helper. You will not be doing this alone. In fact, the only way you'll have even a remote chance to do it is because you will have been filled with the Spirit. Wow. I really like what Chelsea said. Chelsea, you said we act toward them or retreat them the same way we would if they weren't hostile. That's a really good answer. I kind of wish I hadn't heard it. <laughs> uh, because the reality is that we do, that does impact us, right? How people respond to us, how people treat us really does impact the way that we treat them. If someone's nice to us, if they seem like they like us, then it's easier to like them. But what if it's someone, what if it's a neo-Nazi person protesting against you? Um, man, that that last, that image of Keisha Taylor um, lying on the body of the neo-Nazi man, shielding him, that's going to stick with me. I, I cannot, wow, that was so powerful. And what a, what a, what a perfect description of what Jesus does, did when he died on, on the cross for us. So powerful. Yeah, it's, it's really stunning because when you read, you know, those two basically passages or paragraphs, the one from last week where Jesus over and again is talking about love, agape, love, 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 love. When he's talking about the relationship of the believers, among themselves and then this week when he comes to talking about our relationship with the world 
and he uses the word miseo, hate, 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 you know, seven times in eight verses. Just the juxtaposition of those two realities. But we have to remember this second time, every time that is headed in one direction. It's from the world toward the Father, the Son, or the disciples. It's never toward, from them toward the world. And if you look in John's gospel, what goes from the Father or from the Son or from the disciples to the world is love. We've not done a real good job of that. We can spew some vile invective against people who are different from us, behave different from us, vote different from us, or a different, uh, a different religion, uh, pardon me, political party from us. We can be awfully ugly and mean. And that is so much not what Jesus calls us to. Yeah. And Patty um, Chipman at 2.48 p.m. says, says that, she's, that she's experienced that personally as well, that church can be a painful place. And that just breaks my heart because that is not what, that's not the church that, that God, that Jesus called his followers to. And yet, at times, we have been those people. All of us have been those people, and I think we need to own it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But there are also times where the church has shined. Um, I remember reading an article about how during the plague periods um, in the Roman emissions made a name themselves. Um, historians have said and, and secretary that killed off a quarter of the Roman Empire, um, the Christians' response to that, the fact that they stayed in the cities, they didn't flee the cities, but stayed and took care of the sick, and not just Christian sick, but everyone, um, that is what led to the spread of Christianity during the second century. And man, we are in a plague right now. I wonder can we respond in ways that show God's love during this time, right? How can we model, like Randy, you were talking about, how can we model the love of Christ to the people around us? What does that look like during a time that's more divisive and more polarized than ever before in our, our nation? So think about what you just said, Joey. Um, here, when everybody was running out, the Christians were running in, kind of like the first responders on 9-11, while the, the people are flowing out of the building, they're running up into the building to try to save people. Some ways, maybe that can be done in very simple steps of action, of grace and caring toward others, uh, rather than just standing on our own rights. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think of this, for example. You know, I don't enjoy wearing this. Um, but if it makes somebody feel more safe, or if it makes somebody actually more safe, then why would I not do it? Yeah, I think yeah. that in our efforts to love and show the love of Christ, um, I think, and there's an element to it that I think is really important to know. And I think what it is that I think the Christians need to be the first ones to do it. You know, like we need to be the, we need to be running first. So it, it's not enough or it's, I want to say it's not enough, but if we're at the back of the line and all these other people have done it and we're like, yes, <laughs> yes, that's good. That's good. At least you did it and you you did it, but I think it is really powerful when we initiate, you know, mm. and the church is mobilized fast before everyone else. I think that is an even more powerful example of the love of God because, and that's what we, we read in scripture. We love him because he first loved us. He initiated. Jesus is the one who initiated everything. And if we want to follow him, be like him, I think it's important not just that we do it, but we got to do it first. Mm. That's powerful, Chris. Thank you. It's powerful. And what a great way to wrap up our, our discussion today, um, centering in on the love of God. Um, 
the world at times will be hostile to the way of God. That's the reality that Jesus has set up for us. But as Christians, we have the privilege of modeling the same love that Jesus modeled for us, which is um, living out the same love that Jesus modeled for us, which is to love a world that is actively, uh, actively hating us. And like Jesus did, um, to be willing to put aside our privileges, to put aside our rights, even to die for the sake of a world that hated Jesus. Thank you so much um, for joining us, Chelsea and Chris, and also for the rest of you for joining us today on this live chat. We have been challenged, we have been enlightened by your comments and questions. Um, there were so much, there's so much good discussion happening in the chat. We weren't able to highlight all of it, but thank you so much for contributing to that. Let's have a word of prayer together and then we'll end. Dear Jesus, we ask that you help us to walk in your paths, which means to walk in the way of love, even as a world around us is the world around us is becoming more and more actively hostile to your way. Help us to live out your words of love, to live out your actions of love, to do as you did, to put aside our rights and privileges so that we can um, show love embrace the world around us. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you all so much for joining us, and we'll see you back here at 2 p.m. next week. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.